Hi, the question on the table is what is servant leadership? I think it's to it's taking the fall if there's a problem you take responsibility you don't so if there's a problem you take responsibility you own it what else for me it's a lot of times just um providing opportunities for my employees to shine i think that's a big part of it and it's not always going to be the cynthia show i like to focus on the employees Good, so giving people opportunities to stretch, to move forward, maybe to be challenged, to grow, to get out of their own way and show themselves that they can do more. One more person, what is servant leadership? I think servant Beware. leadership would be um, being supportive and um, playing more of a supportive role, similar to how, oh, sorry, similar to the example when you were helping Vivian from behind, but letting her lead the direction you were just there to guide. Yeah, by the way, you look beautiful today. Not that you don't look beautiful and normal, but you look like you're ready to get on stage. Okay, so as, you, as many of you know, recently there was a shark tank and we created an our version of servant leadership, a reel for you. So Vivian's gonna put up that reel and we're gonna have you look at the highlights of Shark Tank, and then we're gonna put you into a paired share so you can share about your lessons either from not doing and not participating or from participating and what you learn. So you all have spent a lot of time building this fantastic strategic framework and developing ambitious goals. But to reach these goals, we need to be able to measure our performance. And right now, PACE does not have the infrastructure in place to do so. We need to create a networking system with manufacturers to notify receiving of incoming deliveries in communication with dispatch then, they will be better informed to, in order to plan deliveries more efficiently. Where do we wanna go? We wanna encourage and empower a continuous learning culture and drive success for all of our stakeholders. A mentorship program would allow the newest person at Pace Supply to have access to the rising leaders within the company, allowing them to have a more comprehensive understanding of what career paths are available within Pace. Employee empowerment and job satisfaction are at the heart of our strategic anchors and core values. When employees feel seen and heard, higher morale and productivity are a natural byproduct of these actions. In fact, companies with high employment engagement are 21% more profitable than their counterparts. When employees trust that their coworkers and management have their best interests and truly feel like an employee owner, we'll all receive the ultimate benefit. Creating the development team would help ensure that we're grounded in who we say we are to make sure that we are empowering all employee owners from the bottom up to feel connected involved and feel that we truly are employee focus. Many of these happen in the workplace and we have that ability to change our cultures, to provide a place of wellness, not to hide if there's anything that the pressures are too much to be able to have an open platform for that. Yvonne, thanks for the gut punch. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so as much as we hate to admit it, you're, you're spot on, you know, we slipped, okay? And we are definitely uh, breaking more parts than, than we want to. And, and we need to figure out solutions so that that doesn't continue because our, our customer's patience is wearing thin. Absolutely. And remember, I can help you with this. Since I have you guys all here, I also would like to encourage our executive team to add a director of safety on their board in the future. Safety should never ask for permission to keep our employees, which I consider our Pace family safe. Let's stop talking about it, put some action behind it and make safety a priority. We are a team and together we win. But what um, I was inspired by is, you know, these are these are real thought leaders, the current, future leaders of the organization, um, and they've come 
come forth with ideas that are real needle movers. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, they, they hit the core values. Um, I thought it took a tremendous amount of courage for those that um, had not done public speaking before uh, to get up. I, I just thought that they were, um, I was inspired by, by each and every one. They were all very strong. Wow, Beth, that was, that was really good. That was really good. Our best presentation I've seen in a couple of years. That was incredible. That was awesome. Uh, I, I will be shocked if we see another presentation that, that, that has the potential to have the ROI that, that you have this. I thought it was spot on. I thought it was very forward thinking and positioned us uh, an idea where we need to be in the future. I thought the simplicity in which you delivered your message was very pertinent. It was spot on with your points and I loved your passion and emotion around the subject. And it, it, it would definitely uh, conveyed your, your ownership and your willingness to participate and solve this issue that we have. As a team, we cannot let ourselves down and we cannot let the organization down. It's a lot more than 10 women that are looking at us and seeing how we're going to move this organization forward congruent with what we've all agreed upon. And what we've all said has been important to us. But it's up to us. Not just one member, because it's not, it's not, it's not an I, it's not a me, it's a team, it's a we, it's an us. Here's what you're doing in the breakout room. What did you learn about yourself from participating? And what did you learn about yourself from not participating? Because either way, it's a growth opportunity. And then we're going to bring you back and we want you to share as a group, but in the, in the service of servant leadership, I would not be doing my job if I didn't have you look here because in any time we lean in and say yes or lean out and say no, there's an opportunity. So this is a five minute breakout. So what I wanna hear is from a couple of people who did not participate in Shark Tank and in the sharing with your person on the, you know, your paired share, what, what came up for you? What did you notice about yourself? What's the learning? And of course there needs to be a learning to share. If there is no learning, then there's not much to say, but from someone who had an insight about, oh, isn't this interesting? This is what I saw for myself out of not participating. Okay, so out of not participating, um, the issue that I do have, I don't have a lot of issues with um, PACE as a company. The issue that I do have is um, individuals not being held accountable or when they say they're going to do something. Um, mm -hmm. So by me not speaking up about that, uh, my issue may never get resolved and or may take additional time to get resolved. Um, but I didn't really know how I would present that or, um, you know, how I would approach a Shark Tank presentation about, you know, accountability. Um, so by me not participating, I do feel that, you know, um, the issue will continue on longer than anticipated. Yeah, good. Great, Sarah. So how many of you hear yourself in Sarah, see yourself in Sarah? Like if I want to do something about it, I have to step forward and be the change or it's not getting resolved. Just raise your hand. Good. So I want to hear from one other person who did not participate in Shark Tank. I um, can go. I, okay. Go ahead. Are you sure? Thank you. Um, I'll talk fast. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll be time. Um, <laughs> so, so my issue is that I'm, it pissed me off. I'm super frustrated. I signed up to participate and I just, I'm so overwhelmed with work that I felt like I had to do my work stuff first. And I just, I, I couldn't find the time. I didn't find the time. I'm, you know, cause I'm just working right. and it's like, and then when, and then when I do say something, you know, I get the whole like, oh, well, because you're not doing enough and because you have to find the time and it's like, you know what, mm. I've just, I don't know what else to do. So I've <laughs> learned about myself that I am super frustrated and irritated by stepping back. That's what I learned. You're frustrated and irritated with yourself for stepping back. Yes. Even okay, though good. I don't know what else I could have done. 
but well, you know. So here's the thing, Lynette Never and sleep. everyone. <laughs> so, so this is for you and everyone. How many of you have things in your life that are not working? They're unworkable. They're not working. Whether it's your body size, your health and wellness, your relationship with your mother, your father, your spouse, your kids, your relationship with your bank account, your relationship with uh, housework <laughs> or keeping the house up. How many of you are frustrated with unworkability and irritants in your life that you just don't seem to have time to deal with? Please raise your hand. Nice and loud. So you're not alone, Lynette. But there's something deeper that you're not aware of right now. There is a blind spot. And I know we're going back four months, right? But there's something that you don't know that you don't know that's in the way for you. And so I'm going to invite you to put at stake dealing with the intolerations that you've been dealing with. So we tolerate crap. We tolerate people who work with us. By the way, where are you? Because there's so many faces that don't do what they say, right? We tolerate it. Does anybody know who Natalie Noriel is? Yes? She can't seem to get in. And that name, I don't remember interacting with her at all in, in PWP, so I feel bad. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to speak? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay, take your hand down. So here's the <laughs> I thing. did. They're called tolerance. So everybody get your pen. What are you putting up with tolerating that is not working for you? So I was talking to my coach and I said, I'm so sick and tired of people not following process at Keen Alignment. And I'm so tired of people not doing what they're supposed to do. And she said, who owns the company? She's right. But we work with people and we let them off the hook constantly. And by the way, a big piece of servant leadership, this is interesting, Sarah, is accountability for others. If okay. you look at your inner metrics, the number one competency is accountability for others. So when we allow people to not do what they said they were going to do, to let us down, to break their promises, we are tolerating. So I'm gonna to talk to you about something that happened in my life. And how many of you are moms? How many of you have kids? Please raise your hand. So I want you to hear this story without getting emotionally charged. So my son's wedding was August 21st. It was supposed to be last year. I held a big shower for them. I flew my whole family in, you know, this is a big deal for me. And then COVID had the wedding stop last year but they rescheduled it for August 21st. On August 19th, I tested positive for COVID. Oh, shit. Oh, oh. But I'm going to ask you to listen from neutral Buddhas. Buddhas, everyone go like this, because I'm going to tell you some things that are going to make you crazy. Neutral means you have no opinion. You're just hearing the story. He texts me and says, again, your family is ruining my life. The Grazianos are non-vaxxers. You've been hanging out with non-vaxxers. I cannot believe you got COVID and a litany of texts. Stay Buddha. Stay Buddha. He's 30 years old. He works at Facebook. He makes more money than God. He's got a big house in Santa Barbara. He drives a Tesla. My whole life is wonderful except for you. Buddha, take a deep breath. Buddha. <laughs> So my mom flies in, my other son's flying. I say, I got to go home. I'm not welcome at the wedding. I have COVID. Now, mind you, I have no symptoms, none, none. My ex-husband, Buddha, 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 texts me and says, take another test because these tests are bullshit. They don't work. So I go take another test and I'm negative. My son says, even if you're negative, you need to be in the corner and you cannot interact with anybody because I don't trust that you're negative. Buddha, 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 Buddha. <laughs> My mom goes crazy, says you should slap him in the face. You should have slapped him in the face when he was four. And when, you know, my mother's Italian, right? When he was nine, when he was 16, Buddha, 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 Buddha. My brother says, I'm not going to the wedding. And there's this big drama. Now I'm hurt, ladies. I'm very, very hurt. I'm hurt by this. I feel like a knife has gone in my heart. 
Now I want to tell you something else and then we'll talk about why I'm sharing this. So a year and a half ago, I took the kids two years ago. I took my son and his fiance to Lisbon and over cocktails. I said, you know, I've had this weird fear and I know it's unrational, but I'm going to share it. And the fear is that at the wedding, I will be put in the corner and Jim, my former husband and his girlfriend will be like, she'll be like the mother of the groom. Now I had like this premonition that this happened. So I am literally spinning like, and I'm getting these violent texts in my words, violent, that was not neutral from my son. So I blocked him. I said, I can't, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be abused. I need to walk my own talk. I blocked him. So he sends, so, and I went home. I drove from Santa Barbara home crying, upset, but I had a conversation with my mom yesterday and she said she was much more calm. And she said, I did not want to go to that wedding. And I only went for you. She said, but I want you to think about all the crap you tolerated from your sons when they were little, all the times you allowed them to swear at you and yell at you and not do their chores. And you know what, ladies, she was right. I tolerated poor behavior from all three sons while they were growing up because I had no understanding of boundaries. I had no understanding of consequences. And she used to say, if you tell them you're, they're going to be in the room, if, if they're going to be grounded, if they don't do something or if they don't do the dishes, then you need to keep to it. But what you do, Margaret, is you tell them they're grounded and then you want to go out and have fun and you take them with you because you don't want to leave them home alone. Does any of this sound familiar to anybody who's raising kids? So please, he's 30 years old. We're going to have to go to therapy over this thing. But it's me who allowed it for all those years. And it's me who is married to his father, Jim. Now, Buddha, 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 Heather. I'm a tough cookie. And you know I'm a tough cookie because you've known me. I was earning, paying for my family to live from the time these kids were born. I was the provider. When I would go out to work, Jim would say, there you go in your pumps or your high heel shoes and your mini skirt, and you live this great life and I'm stuck here with these kids. And then he would throw a, a few choice words at me, four letter words, imagine the worst word ever. And those kids heard it. Those kids heard it. I stayed married to him for five years longer than I should have stayed married to him because I didn't believe in myself enough that I could handle my life without being married. I still struggle with boundaries. I still struggle with holding people accountable, but I want you to know that it comes from a deep feeling for all of us is that we don't matter, that we don't, what we need doesn't matter. And so if you could see, and I've been working with my coach and my therapist with this stuff, if I could, if I could look and say, when did this begin that I would allow men to treat me the way I don't want to be treated, which I raised three of them and they're good kids. This one is, you know, he, 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 he's on a bad track right now. We'll have to deal with that. He'll have to deal with it. I don't have anything to say about it. He's 30, but we tolerate things all over us. We tolerate people saying they're going to meet us for dinner and blowing us off. We tolerate people saying, I'm going to schedule that appointment and they blow us off. We tolerate it. We give people permission to treat us like crap. And we don't have to do that. So I want you to make a list of what are you tolerating from people? Where are you letting people walk all over you, not do what they said, not deliver what they promised, not, you know, they, they blow you off. They don't call you. And then when they call again, you run and go on a date with them or whatever it is, work or home, please write a list of the tolerations. And then I want you to continue that list. So I see you looking at me. I want you to get a pen and write, write. This is how you learn. You process. It's actually psychologically proven. You will learn when you process. So what are you tolerating? What are you putting up with? Where do you put yourself last? Personally and professionally.
And then to, to top it off, what are you putting up with from yourself? What are you tolerating from yourself? Oh, Yana is the person that's trying to log in. I'm like, what does Yana mean? <laughs> I thought it was like code word or something. <laughs> Oh, you're not alone. I didn't know what that meant. So it's, 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 we, we as women are much more tolerant than men, but we create it. I created that situation at the wedding. I even had a premonition that it would happen. I didn't know it would be COVID, but I had a deep, deep feeling somehow I would be not there. So I'm just going to give you one more minute. What are you tolerating? And by the way, I never lashed out at my son. I never called him any names. I went home. But here's what I got out of that. My mother, my brother, David and Zach, who are my other two sons and my sister-in-law and my sister, Debbie, and my other two sisters who didn't come to the wedding because they did not want to get vaccinated because you had to be vaccinated to be allowed in the wedding. Everybody called me. My girlfriends called me. The man I'm dating canceled all his plans and was there for me. And so what I got out of my son's rejection was surrounded by love. And I got how many people love and care for me. And I also got, this is the, the, the big kicker, that when somebody doesn't love and care for me, I beg them to love me. My therapist calls me the beggar. You guys might not like that. You might think that's mean, but it works for a tough cookie like me. So you know what? I'm on a break from my 30-year-old son right now. He owes me an apology, not because I wasn't invited to the wedding because I had COVID, but for the horrible accusations of like hanging, I, I, whatever. I don't need to get into that, but the way he treated me was not okay. And if I'm gonna have compassion for him, he was raised by his father and that's how his father treats women. It was the role modeling that I put up with because I was too insecure to leave. And I learned that from my mother who stayed for 25 years in an abusive marriage. We didn't know. So I love my mother's feedback, but I, I said to her in a very loving way yesterday, I get it, mom, I shouldn't have put up with it, but I learned from the best of how to tolerate it. And I love you. And I learned a lot of other good things from my mom. But listen, guys, we're always working on ourselves. And we know Pace has a problem with accountability. We know Pace has a problem with accountability. You all have had 100% more training than any of the men in that organization and leadership, 100% more. So you don't need Shark Tank to send a memo to the president. You don't need Shark Tank to make an appointment with Malou, your new VP of people and say, can we talk about accountability and the impact of not having any? It's up to you to be the change you wanna see. It's up to me to have a boundary with my son. It's up to me to tell the men in my life that I date or that I serve or that pay me to co consult or coach them that here's my ground rules and the women in my life. Okay, so we're done with that. Now we're gonna hear from two people who did participate and what did you learn about yourself in participating? I'll go. This is Yvonne. Good. Okay. I learned that the video was probably better than being in person because my legs were shaking so badly it would have been like terrible for them to see. <laughs> I also learned that I may not be the best presenter, but I can make an impact. Mm. Those pictures came to me two hours before I presented. And it was like, there it is. That's what I need. It was hard. It was hard and it took time. It, it took time I didn't have, but I did it. 
in the hours after hours, <laughs> but I did it. And it made me understand that pace supply has a problem at the deepest root of problems. We can't get material to our customers. And if we don't do something, we won't have a company. Mm. By the way, I want you all to know there are people entering your space in the e-commerce world. They want to have your, they want to eat your company for lunch and dinner. Of course keep, they do. <laughs> keep on top of those people you work with. Just because you did Shark Tank, Yvonne, doesn't mean it's going to get handled. You got to not let this thing die. You got to go get an army of... <laughs> And Sarah, by the way, it was all about accountability. So, you know, Sarah, there was a lot of people who talked about the accountability and the lack of it at Pace Supply and what it's doing to our company. So even though you didn't speak, you were speaking. <laughs> Just don't give up, right, Yvonne? No, we can't. We, you know, we talked about only two presentations going forward with the, the support group or however it does. But in the breakout room, I was talking with Sarah, I told her, I said, you know, they made one of the suggestions that they made is that Dominique and I were kind of on the same topic. Mine was a little more focused on the, the warehouse, but the idea is the same and use Dominique for that part of it. And I'll work the trenches for you all day, Dominique. I'll get in there because we got to get this done. Yeah, so part of my philosophy with cultural transformation, which is what I believe PACE needs. Uh, and, and when I say transformation, you guys have a good company, you're healthy, you're flush with revenue, right? But the old way of thinking, the old way of working will get disrupted from the outside in if the inside doesn't disrupt it. And part of the way how we do it when we work with companies is we put task forces together. So a task force to do mentoring. Maybe there's 25 people with Dom leading it. I don't know, but it's a task force and there's somebody for warehouse and there's somebody for the sales counter and there's somebody for inside sales and there's someone for whatever else you need. But it's got to get done at the grassroots level or it's not going to get done. And if you really are employee owners, it's the grassroots efforts that are going to change. And when, when Kelly and Jim said punch in the gut, it's because if you want to have them listen, you've got to go after those strategic anchors. You've got to go after what they created. And by the way, in the Shark Tank presentations, every one of you did that without being coached to do that. Every one of you did it. And Keith was humbled that you have bought into that and that you're eating and breathing and drinking those anchors. And that's why they were shaken. Just don't give up. This program ends in November and it is the beginning. It is the beginning. Okay, who's next? Somebody that presented that day. What did you learn about yourself? I'll go. Okay, thanks, uh, Beth. I it was really liberating. It was something that you know I realized that I've just been allowing myself to coast, and it was really good to have have just let my voice be heard. Yeah and allow myself the space and just demand demand that I be heard and not just bitch about it in the background. <laughs> Good. You know, I mean that's kind of that's kind of what what the culture of pace is in a way is is we all we all talk about, you know, oh well, you know, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. But you know, since my manager doesn't say it's okay that, you know, the whole chain of command is so alive and well. Um, you know, I've been, I've been slapped quite a few times over the years about not following the chain of command. And, you know, it's just like, well, the chain of command is bullshit. And, you know, yeah, there's respecting the, there's respecting the levels, but then there's, well, I, you know, it's just, it was nice to be heard and it was nice to be given a platform and 
just taking the ideas that were were given and trying to flesh them out. And, you know, yeah, only two of the, the ideas are going to be moved forward, but I think that every single one of them that was brought up should be because they were all wonderful. They were all valid and necessary, but how can we weave it in? How can we weave in the engagement at our branch? How can we weave in the training and make it so that our manager hears us? It doesn't necessarily have to be like a like an approved thing to move forward with. Exactly, exactly. So I wanna, we've talked, so thank you. Thank you all of you for sharing. And I really want you to hear me that the change will only happen from the inside out. The chain of command is dead. Just nobody informed your chain yet. Seriously. So you got to inform them. Like I told those, for those of you that watch the video, and if you haven't, I highly recommend you do. I don't know if we were being recorded, but I told them the lid is off. So help me keep my word. The lid's off. Your ideas, that idea that you had, Beth, of having that $6,000, it's probably going to be more like $10,000, but go do it. It's not a company-wide initiative to have the branch managers get together and talk about how, the, or eat, the branches have these tap groups that can talk about how we can be better, go do it. What are they gonna do, fire you for trying to make an improvement? Some of these things are not system-wide improvements. Some of them are just, we can't keep doing things the way we're doing it. So servant leadership is being willing to stand in the fire and stand for something in the face of no agreement. That's transformation. When I look for consultants to partner with me in leading programs, they have to be willing to stand in the face of no agreement. Because when we do level sets, even when I do Ignite Power, which is the program that birthed this program and Eileen was in it. Invitations went to many, many women at Pace. Only one said yes. That's no agreement. And then Eileen stood for, we need something like this in our company. She, she went to the executive group in the face of no agreement. You've got to be willing to do that. So let me let me uh, get started with what we are doing here. So we are going to start you, you guys down the road. And I know you've had a lot of different guest trainers and and we we go. If you haven't figured it out, we gave you the whole overview the first few days. And now we're going deep into each segment of what we went over and what we covered in the first couple of days. When we complete our completion day, I hope every one of you is there. It's gonna start on an evening, on a Tuesday evening at seven o'clock. And then we're gonna come back the next morning and we're gonna be there all day Wednesday. And it's live. So I highly encourage you to show up, bring your mask, bring your vaccines and uh, show up. But what we want you to do is take a look at your original who you are as a leader. Who did you say you were as a leader when this thing started? I am a highly effective fab manager was Nancy. I am the director of operations and training for the luxury finish department and PBK. We have created and designed a new business model that maximizes excellent customer experience. And then you go on to talk a lot more, Melanie. I want one line with no more than six or seven words. We want it to be clear who I am is a conduit for people to unleash their power at work. That's mine. You want to keep it short and simple so you can remember it and say it to yourself before you walk in a room in the face of no agreement. Beth, I am a strong, successful ad advocate for the integration of PACE culture within the Hawaii region. 
That's what I saw that day in those presentations. Millie, I'm an ambassador for Pace Supply. I advocate positive change within our company and empower more women to be in leadership roles. Now you're in HR. You created that future and you're living into it. Giselle, I'm a valued partner on the leadership team with an influence on the mission and strategic direction of the company. And then you go on and on to talk about how you're gonna do it. I just want a statement from you so that when I'm interacting with you live for the first time, well, many of you I have met, but many of you I have not, I wanna look at you and say, Sarah Straub, and know that mission. We wanna be able to write it on a placard so it can't be really long. Lynette, I lead the charge into battle. If that's not written in front of your computer, my friend, put it on there. I lead the charge. That means you gotta lead the charge. Margaret, I'm a freight manager for all pace supply, working with the purchasing department, financing department. That Margaret is about what you're doing, not who you are as a leader. I want you to, who I am as a leader is someone that makes stuff happen. Someone that opens the heart and soul of managers so they can be better. Who knows, I'm making it up now. Charity, I'm a leader who empowers and encourages all employees. Angela, I'm a leader of branches. I am bold. I speak my mind. I am helpful. We saw that from Angela uh, in that presentation. She had no script. She had no PowerPoint. She was just up there and you could tell she was working through fear. What it gives you the opportunity to do when you step into your leadership is break through your barriers. In our Ignite Power Retreat program that we do, it's two and a half day immersion. That's how Eileen met me. People had to stand up and create their vision in front of 30 of their peers. And then they got to do a stretch project, kind of like your shark tank, that put them in the hot seat of being that vision. We're doing another Ignite Power in November. They may or may not pay for you to attend. I highly recommend if any of you want to take yourself to the next level, it's the weekend of November 12th. Maybe they'll pay for you. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll say we've paid enough. Sharon Martini is coming. Sharon, if you're here, I, can't, I can only see one screen, but Sharon's is in the next two to three years at Pay Supply, I will be a strategic planning partner. She talks about what she's doing. If you're gonna watch this video, Sharon, if you're not here, it's about who you're being. Natalie, I have shifted our credit department from struggling, frustrated group to a highly valued department that our customers in various departments recognize. All of that's great for your roadmap, but who are you as a leader that shifts the credit department? Who do you need to be as a leader for that to happen? Do you need to be bold? Do you need to speak up? Do you need to, to intervene in the chaos? Yvonne, in 10 years, I will be retired. <laughs> that is not your vision of leadership. <laughs> Who are you gonna be the next 10 years? Who are you as a leader now into the next 10 years? So I didn't read everybody's, but it's two pages. My goal is that this is one page because you guys are succinct to the point. Who I am as a leader is, and I need it for completion. It's super important. It's important for what we're doing. So I'm gonna give you a minute right now. We're gonna put you back into the breakout rooms. And I want you to work with a partner, whoever your partner is, doesn't matter if it's someone different. I wanna hear from a couple of you. What are you hearing about upgrading your vision? What do we mean, upgrade your vision? Getting Jenny, to be a sense of who you are. Yes. And Jenny, you've had a yellow bar around your screen for a while. I think the universe wants you to talk. Okay. Oh, you're leaving now, you guys. I think, are they gone? Are they going yet? They're more leaving right now. Okay, bye. We'll see you when you get back. Okay, so ladies, um, so far, I want to hear from a few people. What are you hearing so far 
out of our first hour. Somebody who hasn't shared yet, Charity. So out of the first hour to touch on, to touch on a little bit, um, I'm sorry, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, I wasn't know if I was still muted. Um, I had a, a lot of uh, a lot to throw out there on everything that we've been covering um, to kind of see what I've learned about myself from not being in the shark tank to touch on that. Um, I was learning immediately when I said, hey, uh, you know, I'm not going to make it, you know, um, immediately missed opportunity. And, you know, Charity, this is what you do every time. No, 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 no. And then once the opportunity passes, dang it, I could have done that. Um, so just being a little more, just being, having more grace is a word that uh, myself and Catherine were using, having more grace with myself, because I have the tendency to have all, to share all that grace and that understanding, you know, that I have for, that's reserved for other people, you know, not for myself. So having the courage and the understanding and the grace to, to allow myself to take opportunities and understand that I'm not always going to be the best at the beginning, but to practice these things is going to give me that lesson that I need at the end to become the leader that I'm saying out loud that I am. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from what I know of you, I will tell you, I was disappointed when I saw your name drop the list. I think many of you are called to make a difference that scares the shit out of you. That's a good thing. Step into that. Stepping back, shrinking who you are so other people or you feel safe, that doesn't provide what the world needs. We are in trouble. Pace is a good company. It's a good company. You're not in trouble. But look around at the world. It's in trouble. We, if we could make a difference in the workplace, if we could shift how people treat each other in the workplace, if we could shift how we treat ourselves in the workplace, then we can actually have better communities. And I invite you to consider that there is a bigger calling for you than where you're sitting right now. And Maji, shrinking myself was actually on my tolerating, on my list, a list and list of things of what I tolerate from within myself and everything that I had on that list, I made sure that there was, you know, it pertains to other people as well as myself. So there was an accountability for myself within what I'm accepting, accepting from others. Um, so, but the shrinking of myself to make others, you know, to allow others to take the spotlight because I feel uncomfortable thinking that I'm making other people feel uncomfortable by being bright, if that makes sense to anybody. Yeah, it does. So being, being bigger than I think that I should be. Yeah. So ego is a funny thing. This is really yeah. interesting. Some of us think it's our ego. Like we don't want to be too egocentrical. So we don't want to be the center of attention. So I was a single mom at a young, young age. So it, yeah, I got pregnant at 19. I get married to what I thought was a really nice man. Even when I realized I was in the depths of hell, Jim is a nice man. He's just not a good husband, actually. And I guess that's up for debate, depending on who's evaluating him. But the point is, I stayed in that marriage because I didn't want to be a double divorcee, right? That was friggin' ego. I have so much to share with women in the world. And people say to me, well, why aren't you out there doing bold talks and, and, and confronting people online? I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to stir up any trouble. Well, if you go to LinkedIn, you'll see I stirred up some big trouble yesterday about people collecting unemployment <laughs> and choosing not to work. Very controversial. <laughs> but it's taken me, it's taken me a few years to look at what is ego and the very same ego that could have Donald Trump get on there and say all those things that he said. And I know a lot of people like Donald Trump and I'm actually hearing he actually did a few really good things for world peace and a few really good things for the economy. But I didn't know it because I just listened to everything he said that I didn't like. So there's that kind of ego, like, look at me, listen to me. And then there's another ego that says, I got to be really teeny, 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 teeny small because I don't want to draw too much attention to myself. 
but you can't make the difference. I can't make the difference. You can't make the difference if you're invisible. If we really want to be the change that we want to see, we got to step out there. So thank you, Charity, Charity, for seeing that. Who else? What's something you see from the last hour? I can add on to that. Um, Dom here. So the biggest thing for me, and it's kind of on the same round of charity, is like after doing the Shark Tank presentation, the big thing I took away was after re-watching the videos and hearing the comments after my presentation and hearing certain comments that kind of like rode me wrong, like, oh, well, that's not like Dom to like speak up like that. And I'm thinking, well, if you ask anyone I work with on a daily basis, they're going to be like, Dom's always speaking. Or even the women that I've interacted here, I speak up and I do a lot. So the fact that they weren't seeing me in that same light was kind of like, huh, okay, Dom, like you need to speak up more and you need to execute and put yourself in a position where they're seeing you as your true self. They're not just seeing you as somebody who's getting the task done when you're interacting with them. Um, Something like I always joke with Cynthia and then like our team is like, I'm the executor. Like I get in there and I get shit done and I move on to like, that's just my personality. That's how I process things. And so when we're, I was working on trying to define who I am as a leader, well, I'm an executor, I get it done. And so making sure that, people in the company that are on that higher level that yes this is a great opportunity but I need to keep showing them like hey I'm not here just to pitch you like a cool idea that sounds good no we're here to execute it and take it to the next level yeah so and then realizing that there are so many women within this or this organization and just within this little group that we have right here that have similar ideas or that can help push this through it's like you have a whole new network almost of people that you can work with to now push these plans through and show them that we are serious and we want to get things done here we don't want to just do our six-month program and then like cool thanks for it my big thing is we have this opportunity now how are we going to capitalize on it and how are we going to move forward on it not only on our end of things but on the executive end of things as well yeah and you are a community this is a community it's pwp one Hopefully there'll be PWP two and PWP three. And my, my, my goal is that some of you go out into your communities and bring this kind of training to the people in your communities, to the underserved people. By the way, on that note, we have scholarships available for Ignite Power. If you know people who cannot afford $495, but they are making it happen in their families and in their life, and you want to give them the gift, we will, Suzanne's in charge, raise your hand. We have, for every three paid participants, we give one away. But any of you that are called to go out to your communities or talk to single moms or mentor the young women coming into your company, go do it. Go do it. But this is a community and it will always be PWP1, which is why I'm so uh, encouraging of you to show up live for that final completion because it is going to be spectacular. Okay, now I want you to look at your vision for yourself as a leader. And I'm gonna give you another assignment and your job listener. So if you're a listener, your job is to listen. Remember this, listening to my crazy story, be Buddha, no judgment. Listen to their vision and then say, why is that important to you? One time, then they're gonna answer. Why is that important to you? Two times. Why is that important to you? Three times. And you gotta listen. Why is that important to you? Four times. Why is that? And then you got to listen. Why is that important to you five times? Why is that important to you six times? Why is that important to you seven times? Why is that important to you eight times? Why is that important to you nine times? I don't want this to be a 20 minute breakout, but you're rapid firing two people, one charity sharing. This is my vision. Yvonne is her partner. Why is that important to you? By the time you get to the ninth, your vision may change. What I don't want you to do is go into story time. Well, because when I was 12, the you know I got dumped. No, 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 no. Why is that important to you? Because equal rights are important to me. Why is that important to you? Because there's a lot for me to share. Why is that important to you? Because I'm sick and tired of playing small. Why is that important to you? And I want you to get off your seat and stand up while you are having this conversation. 
The ladies who were part of PWP, they know most of them were standing. So get off. By the way, sitting is the new smoking. Stand up, stand up. And Vivian, please put them for a nine Y. I'm giving you 10 minutes max. And I want you to generate like your life depends on it. This is my vision. Why is that important to you? Why is that important to you? Nine times. So it's a 10 minute breakout. Have fun. Okay. Who wants to uh, do a nine wise with me? Oh. Mm. Oh, Maji. Who is it? I can't, I can't. It's Giselle, but I volunteer for everything because I'm always willing. But if there's somebody else, I'm so happy to let them in. <laughs> going once, going twice. Giselle, who are you as a leader? Well, I don't have a, a real, um, I don't have my, my line made yet, but. Uh, Doesn't so matter. Just tell me who you are as a leader. I am. Uh, I love turning vision into action so that we can share the experience of change together. Why is that important to you? Because I really love uh, ideas. Why is turning vision into action important to you? Because I love to see the change that that can bring and um, and if it's just a vision and not being turned into action, then there's such an opportunity lost. Why is it important to you to turn vision into action? Don't write down, don't look down, look at me, put your eyes by the green dot, be with me. Yeah, if no, I, I was am. with you, I was with you, I'd be toe to toe right now. Yeah. <laughs> so why is turning vision into action important to me? Um, I am an action person, and if you just have an idea and don't do it with anything with it, then it's disappointing. Why is it important to you to turn vision into action? Um, because vision is what motivates my world. Why is it important to you to turn vision into action? Because vision is fun uh, and motivating. Why is it important that you're having fun and motivated while turning vision into action? Hmm. Uh, because I want the people around me to share that fun with me. Why is it important to you that the people around you are having fun while turning vision into action? Because I love people and I, I want to share that warmth with them. Why is it important to you to share warmth with people and have fun around vision and action? Um, Stand up, open your body position. That means like this, open body position, good job. Why is it important to you to turn vision into action, have people have fun and have warmth? Because the world is made up of a lot of different people and vision and ideas. And I really glory in that, in learning about all of it. Great. So I want you to adjust the screen so we can see your face because you're a leader and we want to see your face, not your boobs. Um, but keep, keep standing up. Oh, you have nice boobs. I'll just tell you that. Thank you. <laughs> Why is it important for you to turn vision into action? Because I want the world to get better. Why is it important for you that the world gets better? Because the opportunity is out there and the potential is out there and I want to reach for it for Great. all of us. So when you do the nine whys, thank you, give her a round of applause. Some different person, what do you see can happen when you use a liberating structure like the nine whys. I can go. Oh, this is Dominic. Hello. Oh. Hello. Um, so going into the nine whys, you you start at that base level and you're you're kind of unsure where you're going with it, but the continuation of asking why it forces you to go deeper and see what problems you're trying to solve with. Uh, that leader 
that you are. Good. And you saw that with her. She went from herself to the community at work to the world. Every human on the planet wants to make a difference. They just don't know how or they don't know that they can. But if you if you just look at whether it's deep spiritual teachings of any religion or any leadership training, it's always about fundamentally, I'm here for a reason and I make a difference. So Gandhi, regardless of your, he, he's not a religious person. He was a political person. He was a lawyer. Servant leadership is giving up your agenda in service of the bigger agenda. Now, this is the primary definition here. Servant leadership is a philosophy and a set of practices that enriches the lives of others, builds better organizations, and ultimately creates a more just and caring world. I left recruiting. I had a $5 million recruiting company. And for any of you guys that doesn't know what that means, for me, it means me and my husband made a lot of money. But I was no longer fulfilled. For, it was fulfilling to get people jobs, but I wanted to do more. I wanted to unleash the human spirit. Can't really do that in recruiting. You know, I could place them and after 30 days, you can't talk to them anymore. The best thing I did in my life was sell that company. The best thing that happened to me was the failure of the software company, because then I was like stuck with nothing. And I had, what am I going to do? My coach said, if you had no limits, what would you be doing? I said, I would be unleashing the human spirit at work. I'd be unlocking potential and boom, keen alignment was born. And five years later, we were in the Inc. 5,000. Why that happened is because it was a spiritual calling for me, Ezra, which you have that you might not be willing to deal with right now. You have a bigger purpose. You know that. Yeah. Just at least give me some kind of head nod. <laughs> but it's about allowing yourself to lean into that bigger purpose. So we're going to give you a break. Uh, 10 minutes max. We'll see you at 1140. All right. So we're going to get started. So this morning we talked about our vision as leaders. We talked about going deep and you saw that, that people went deep and now we're gonna talk about the element of servant leadership at the deepest level is to be of service. It isn't about you. It isn't about taking a leadership job so that you can be on the executive team or taking a leadership job so you can tell people what to do. It's being of service, being a vessel that work gets done through you. And as you learned through your public speaking training that you had, it begins with presence. And when and those of you that did Shark Tank, you know, we had to get up, we had to shake out your body, we had to be with that camera. Who you are is immediately judged whether you like it or not the moment you show your face in the office, the moment you show your face in a meeting, the moment you meet a new person. Within 30 seconds, they've made their impression of you. They're unconscious bias. So, you know, you guys have seen me present where I've got makeup on and I've got clothes. If you, if you participate in Ignite Power, I'm in yoga clothes the whole weekend. I still show up as a leader. I'm still on time. I'm still generating every moment. But our look, our clothes, what we wear, how we do our hair, the color of our glasses, how we communicate, our body language, whether we use our hands or not, that's all presence. That's why I say open body position. I can be in a room. I was, I was speaking to a bunch of CEOs on Monday, I think, or Tuesday, and they were all like this. And I said, okay, guys, it's time to give feedback. And they were giving each other feedback on the missions and visions on if they were inspiring or not. And they were like listening like this. And I said, so let's stop for a minute. What does it look like? to the guy giving the other guy feedback when the body language is like this. What do you think they said? What does this mean? What does this show people? Closed. Closed, what else? Guarded. Yep. Skepticism. Yep, good. So open body position, which we're gonna talk a lot about because on our, on our final 
uh, closing of this PWP program, we deal with a lot of intuition and people intuit from body language. They intuit from tonality. They intuit from, from what you do with yourself. So it is head to toe. Now you might notice that some people, not the new vice president, I mean, she looks like she is on every minute of the day, but some people have ostensible authority through the level that they have put themselves that they might go a little more casual. So if you model yourself over that little more casual, but you haven't earned that credibility, you distance yourself from creating presence. And I don't want you to hear me say it's all about your clothes, but it's the first impression. The first impression needs to be a lasting impression. What about energy level? What does energy level have to do with presence? I have a question, Aji. This is Giselle. So when you talk about first impression, do you have the opportunity to make a first impression every day, every time you go into a meeting? Or are you talking about just the first time you're meeting somebody? That's a great point. I actually think every day is, but in the leadership training um, that I've participated in that we lead, it's about beginning again. Every day is a new day. Let's say the first time you meet the president of Pace, you were having a bad day. You wore a spaghetti strap skirt or dress. You didn't know he was coming and you didn't have your hair done. You had no makeup on your glasses. I mean, were you guys, didn't I do a training when my glasses were broke with you guys? Like the glass, I stepped on my glasses. What if that was the first day? So each time you come back, you're deepening their impression or shifting their impression. So, but, but let's say you never get a second chance. That's why they say the first impression is a lasting impression. People will make things up. Oh, she cares about her image. Oh, she only eats healthy food. Oh, she doesn't get, she's not hot headed or, oh, she's very passionate. So what else? What are you hearing about presence? Take yourselves off mute. Boom, boom, boom. Um, being, actually being there, being in it. Good, good. That's, that's, that's the next level. So it begins with the facade, the look, the body language, how you move your body, how you notice I am in the middle of the camera and so are the two women now where I see they both work with me, Vivian and Suzanne. They've kind of got themselves in that camera. Zoom is very limiting. We live in the world of Zoom and you guys work for a company big enough. You may never not live in the world when you have company wide meetings, but you want to make sure, like we've talked about before, that you're in the center of this box, that people can see your face, that you look at the green dot. As some of you know, I'm pretty involved in the Tony Robbins organization. I'm spending a year being mentored by Tony Robbins. He teaches us in class one. You don't leave people emails, you video them. Let them know who you are, but he's always looking into the green dot. When I used to video, I used to look at myself and make sure I looked good. But it's not about me, it's about connecting to my audience. But Yvonne is going a deeper level with presence. Do you remember the mirror work we did on day one? Yes. Yep. How you see yourself beyond the facade, beyond the nice earrings, and maybe you guys don't think they're nice, but I like them, beyond the hair and the hair clip is who's there? Who's the soul of that human being? Am I present? Am I listening? Do I hear you? Do I remember? If you're a person who never remembers things that you agreed to do, got news for you, you're not present. You're somewhere else, you're out to lunch. You cannot be present if you're multitasking. You cannot be present if you're doing this while you're talking to somebody, you won't remember. And a, the biggest insult you can give your boss, your coworker, your employees is that they're sharing something with you that's important to them and you don't remember. It left your brain. Well, the reason it left your brain is because you weren't present. So presence begins with how you look when you walk into the room, 
but I could look great and I could be doing a talk and I could not connect with each person in the room. That's not presence. Presence is I am looking at Nancy. I am looking at Melanie. I am with Giselle. I am with Beth. I am with Corey. I'm with Margaret. I see you. You see me. And when you speak, I remember what you said. Might not remember it verbatim, but I got the essence. Okay, she's bringing cookies. She needs to have the logo. Reach out to her. But I can't take that on, but I can remember that conversation. So what else do you think has to do with presence besides being present, besides looking at your best? What else? Self-assurance. Yes. Yeah, so so then you don't have to think about you. You can think about the other person. Really good. Thank you for, hold on a second. Thank you for taking that to the next level. When I'm not worried about me, when I'm self-assured, when I got me, I can get you. If I don't get me, I can't get anybody. It's why they say don't get into a relationship. If you don't like yourself, any relationship you get into, you're going to attract what you don't want. You're gonna, if you don't respect yourself, you're gonna attract people who don't respect you. If you don't love yourself, you're gonna attract people who don't love you. So someone else said eye contact, yes. Now Zoom is kind of hard because I can look down here at you guys and then it doesn't look like I'm looking, does it? So you gotta look at the green dot. If you have an opportunity to do a UPW with Tony Robbins, if you ever do that, He's got like 24,000 people worldwide. It's really kind of cool. You meet people from all over, but he's got big signs that say, look at the green dot. <laughs> because Zoom is kind of wacky. But if you're in a room, if you're in a presentation, you guys are all going to be together. And I got news for you. We are going to be very interactive with each other in November. And there's going to be times you're addressing everybody from the front of the room. Part of your training in connecting with each other is to connect eye to eye with each person you're addressing because you could see if they get you or not. The problem with presenting on Zoom and for those of you that you know didn't have your camera on because you, you made a mistake or whatever it was, you couldn't really see, maybe you could see, but I'm not sure, but we couldn't see you. So we didn't know, we didn't get to connect with you, right? And, and so you want to be able for them to see you and know that you're with them and you want to be able to see them. So if, if Zoom or if Teams is going to be part of your life, you want to get really, really good at presenting to that green dot. If you're with people in the room, you want to get really good at connecting to them. Servant leadership is being with people. You could be a follower and be a servant leader. And here's the deal. If you can't follow, you don't like to it's follow directions. Leader. You don't like to do what you're told. It's going to be really, really hard to be a leader. You must follow to lead. I put myself in positions where I volunteer. One time I, I was volunteering at this company called Landmark Education. I thought, oh, I'm going to be a leader, I'm going to get in front of the room. And you know what they gave me to do? They gave me toilets to clean and food to clean up and garbage. And I was like, what? what? This is not assisting. And this woman came to me and she said, what is your definition of assisting? I'm like, well, I want to be coaching people. She said, how could you coach people when you're not humble enough to pick up their trash? <laughs> to this day, I go into bathrooms and I wipe down the counter because that's what I learned in that program. Being a leader is leaving the place better than when you got there. Being a leader is going into someone's home and being conscious enough and present enough to say, do I wanna be invited back? And their home is their office, right? Being a leader is leaving the place better. Good, who else? Presence, what is presence about? Turning off your phone? <laughs> yeah, really good. That's kind of a basic one. Turning off your phone. So when cell phones first came out, I talked to you earlier about my boys. When cell phones first came out, 
I was in recruiting. I had had the phone with me all the time because you never knew when the next job order was coming in. You never know, knew who needed me now. By the time I was, I, I guess, 38, 40, I no longer brought the phone with me when I was with my kids. And it was really hard for them to understand. When I'm out with my boyfriend, I don't bring my cell phone. When I'm out with a friend, I don't bring my cell phone. I am there. And it's challenging because sometimes people need to talk to you. When I went on vacation, by the way, I didn't check email. I was, I was not going to break myself being present in Spain. So I'm going to put you into a Vivian, just a one minute breakout. I want you to write down while she's putting you in, where do you need to do your work to be more present? Whether it's with yourself, with the way you look, with your image, with how you dress, with how you want people to see you, with really paying attention. No one said paying attention, but you kind of said paying attention. Where do you need to do the work to up your level of presence? And we're only gonna give you a minute. So start writing. So when you get to each other, it's 30 seconds each. So presence has everything to do with empathy. Now, for all of us, empathy has a different definition, but I want for, especially for those of you who've been quiet, here's the deal in November, November 11th, PWP will be a thing of the past. You've heard from some people who have regrets about not participating in Shark Tank. This is your opportunity to get present and participate in PWP and start sharing. So for those of you who have not been sharing, what does empathy mean to you? Understanding. Good. What else? To be compassionate. Holding good. space without judgment. Very good. What else? Putting myself into somebody's shoes. Very good, which is hard, right? If we've got an opinion about something, so you're all kind of saying the same thing, but different. If, if, I, if I don't hold the space for someone else's experience and I don't like what they have to say, it's really hard to put myself in their shoes because I'm filtering through, what does that mean to me? Oh no, so-and-so doesn't like what they're doing for their job. What does that mean about me? Me, 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 me. No, that's not what it's about. It's about listening. Oh, they don't, they don't like what they're doing. So we either got to find them something else to do or we got to say bye-bye, right? What else? What is empathy to you? The ability to connect with the um, emotion of the story, not necessarily the emotion and your, or I'm sorry, the, the beliefs of what the story, you know. Yeah. So one of my teachers says empathy is soul to soul connection. Many people, especially as you get older, will start to say that we are, there are many people on earth that are human beings, hopefully, hopefully someday wishing that they would have a soul connection or a spiritual connection, or we're spiritual beings having a human experience, right? We're either human beings having a spiritual occasional experience. Oh my God, what an epiphany or we're spiritual beings having a human experience. If you look at Sarah and Bettina and Nancy and Charity and May Lou and Millie and Margaret and everybody as spiritual beings that you happen to be walking on the planet at the same time, easy to have empathy, easy to have empathy. This whole diversity inclusion, right? Diversity, diversity equity and inclusion, it's all about having a soul to soul experience with people, regardless of who they are or what they look like. It truly is connecting. Whether you're doing a performance review or whether you're asking for a raise or whether you're pitching a program, soul to soul connection. And all of this is in the context of servant leadership. So let's talk about the 5% factor. And in the 5% factor, this is more of an uh, empowerment, but we, when we teach this program, we teach that we are the sum of the five people we spend the most time with. So, you know, a, a preacher, Bill Hybels, that I used to go to when I lived in Illinois, he would say stuff rubs off. 
You hang out with people who spend all their time in bars, stuff rubs off. You use four letter words all the time, stuff rubs off. People around you lie, cheat, steal, stuff rubs off. You hang around with people doing volunteer work, making a difference, building people up, stuff rubs off. We are the sum of the five people we spend the most time with. If we want to be a human being having a spiritual experience, maybe we might go to a yoga teacher training. Or if we want to be a spiritual being having a human experience, we will bring in our deep beliefs about our job on earth to our workplace. And when we're surrounding ourselves with people who are gossiping or throwing other people under the bus or complaining about how bad pace is, we're going to say, wow, I really appreciate what you have to say. Maybe you should communicate to the person you have the problem with, but I'm going to stop being in this conversation because I'm really actually committed to being the change. So I'll hear you, but I don't want to participate in the gossip, which ladies, for some of you, it'll be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. So I want you to write down the names of the five people you spend the most time with, whether you like them or not, who are they? Write it down, write it down, write it down. Don't avoid it. When they walk into the room, do they lift your spirit up or are you deflated? If you have a department that needs some help, first thing you want to look at is how do we relate to each other? And by the way, it, you might say, well, Maji, you just talked about empathy. It's not empathetic to tell somebody you won't gossip. Yes, it is. Because servant leadership is holding people into account to be their highest self. And if I'm gossiping and complaining, I'm either doing it for one or two reasons. I want it to change. I want to make a difference or I want you to commiserate with me. So it'd be really great to just ask people, hey, I notice you're complaining. You're, you know, you don't like the boss. You don't like the things she says or the things he says. Is it that you want to make a difference or you just want me to hear the complaint? Because by the way, I think Pace has, a, a, you know, one of those counselors that you can go get employee assistance and complain to the counselor. Right. Those of you that have friends that are energy vampires, you know who I'm talking about. They call you and within 20 minutes you feel slimed because they just gave you all of their caca, all of their garbage. If you're allowing that to be in your space, you rob yourself of your own empathy because you'll be so used to listening to complaints that you won't hear a contribution when it comes. So I think it was in this training, complaining, or maybe it was a different company, complaining is not a conversation. So what are you hearing about the 5% factor? A couple people who have not shared yet, Natalie, Margaret, Melanie. What are you hearing about the sum of the five people you spend the most time with? You need to really be aware of who you spend your time with and who you allow in your space. Yeah. It goes back to the boundary conversation. It goes back to the, how do you let people treat you? If you've always been a recipient of gossip and you don't want to be that anymore because you know, it's not working for your happiness, then you got to tell people I've, I've been in this training and I'm learning that being part of the gossip or part of the, the complaining, it's actually not healthy for me. And if there's a book and it's not part of the program, I, you know, Eileen was very strict with me about not giving you too much to read, but if you, I'm going to uh, actually, I can't tell you about that book because I'm going to give you that book. So sorry. Anyway, there's a lot of books that you can read and one of them touching the infinite. Oh, you can't see it because it looks like I'm in, it looks like I'm in Italy. Anyway, touching the infinite, Infinite by Rodney Smith. Ezra, it might be something that you've read, The Four Foundations of Mindfulness, and then The Journey to the Heart by Melody Beattie. Many of these people talk about the conversations that you engage in are the fabric of your life. If you're unhappy, look at the conversations that you're in. If you're happy, 
Look at the conversations that you're in. If you feel depressed. Now, I was talking to my mom about a lot of stuff, but also about this Gabby thing. And she said that, you know, now they're starting to talk about how damaging social media is because she was posting all the great stuff. She wasn't posting the bad stuff. So there's an illusion that things are great but we got to get responsible for the quality of our conversations. One more person. Thank you, Jenny. What are you hearing about empathy, compassion, presence, who you surround yourself with in the context of servant leadership? I guess all of those things they, they tie into, especially when I'm hearing empathy into, you know, the, the five people that I would surround myself uh, with on a daily basis. So uh, background for me is I, I actually moved into San Jose from, from the Valley. I used to live in Stockton. So all of my support system, my family, everybody lives out there. So coming into San Jose, I surround myself with everybody I work with. Um, so there, I do have five people on my list and there's really only one person that it, it was an immediately no deflated. Um, being that this is somebody that I work with close on a daily basis, trying to find the empathy and connecting with this person in any conversation. And even in our, even in our disagreements, trying to find the empathy and seeing that this person is a human being and has human reactions, just, just because they're, you know, a level above me does not mean that they don't have the same human reactions and emotions that I do. So empathy around the people that do deflate you that have to be a part of your life is really, really hard, ladies. I'm sure I hope we can all connect on that because it's really hard to find that level of, you know, making the best out of that situation. So that's what I got. I connected with the empathy um, completely and the five people that I surround myself with daily. So one of the things you can do if you've got somebody who's angry, hostile, is when you're, of course, you have to feel really secure about yourself and you've got to be in the right frame of mind, but you might say something like, seems like you're really angry. It seems like there's a lot on your mind. Do you need time to gain your composure before we have this conversation? I've actually had to say that to one of the executives at Pace. And those of you in sales probably know who I'm talking about. Doesn't seem like this is a good time for this conversation. Maybe we should come back to it. Seems like you're really upset about something. Because what happens is if for your whole life, you have been wearing your emotions on your sleeves and you just kind of blah, blah, blah to everybody and no one's ever said, hey, this is not okay. How would you know it's not okay? But until you say, yeah, you know what? I've been doing a lot of thinking and I am no longer going to be a person who talks about what's wrong with pace unless I'm willing to do something about it. Because you know what? I'm an owner here. And if something's wrong with pace, then that means I'm part of the problem. Now you start shifting the quality of your conversations. You will raise other people up. But when you engage in that low level, could we let Millie in please? Um, when we engage at that lower level of vibration or lower level of conversation, what I say to my customers, people I coach, my clients, is are you really committed to playing racquetball with the curb? Because that's the level of the conversation, right? You guys remember middle school ladies, right? Everybody kind of talking about each other. Hello, hello. Yes. So we have to move up. We have to move up and out of that in order to elevate our presence. A big element of service leadership is also conveying role value. What conveying role value means is whether you're the janitor the cleaning lady, the lady who makes the food in the lunchroom, the guy who's, who's uh, packing up boxes and shipping, no matter what you're doing, the flight attendant, the person at Starbucks, the barista, the park ranger, whatever they are, whatever they do that you get, that they're providing value. 
And as a leader or a future leader, or, you know, my attitude is all of us are leaders, we're connecting the value of the tasks that that person is doing to the bigger picture of what we're creating. Some people have a really hard time of doing that for themselves. Right now, we have one of the biggest engagement problems in the world, whether it's Ireland or Spain or the United States, COVID has woken up unhappiness in most people. And if you are at all interested in spiritual text, what you'll read almost everywhere is when somebody is being of service, work or volunteer work, they get in touch with their reason, their purpose for living. There is no engagement in sitting on the couch, commiserating with our friend, collecting unemployment. Sometimes we have to collect unemployment, but it's not a lifestyle. Wandering around, looking for our place, waiting for something to knock us in the head that we found our place. That's not a lifestyle. It's finding purpose and meaning in the everyday work. So us as managers, supervisors, coworkers, we have to find the everyday meaning in whatever jobs that people are surrounding us with. And we need to go out of our way to let people know, hey, that thing you're doing, that thing you did, that task, that email you sent, that letter, that presentation, that phone call, that matters. That makes a difference. You make a difference in doing that work. I love this globally. Everyone's saying, I appreciate you. It's now gotten so superficial that it's like, love ya. People that don't even know people are going, love ya. You don't, how do you love ya? How do you love ya? People need acknowledgement for specific contribution and it wires in their brain so they know, hey, that file that you just gave me, that phone call, that makes a difference. You know how it makes a difference? Well, it allows, the, let's just use PACE, it allows the professional women of PACE to come to the training knowing what we're talking about. So it gives them a sense. All of our job to convey role value, whether it's our cleaning lady, whether it's the kid that did his chores, the mailman. So many times we go to Starbucks and we or, or pizza and we just order our coffee, but we don't connect with the person. Thank you. You made my coffee so I didn't have to today. That's servant leadership, acknowledging what people are doing. Listening, when your employee says, listen, I'm fried, I'm burnt out. I need a couple days off. Don't email them when they're off. Don't call them when they're off. Or somebody says, I have boundaries. Every night at five o'clock, I do my spiritual practice and then I have dinner with my family. Don't call them then. I mean, if the place is burning down and you have an agreement, but people get to have boundaries with you, like you want people to have boundaries with you. That, that's servant leadership. So uh, I wanna just hear from a couple of people, then we'll talk about appreciative interviews. In the context of servant leadership, Give me an example in your own life of who you're going to acknowledge today by five o'clock for something at work or in your life outside of work that somebody's done for you. So who's the person? What are you going to acknowledge them for? And what's the big picture that what they did helped you? I'm going to right, Giselle's, Giselle's going to have to go again. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Millie, go for it. Uh, today, I'm going to thank my mother for watching the kids while I was uh, taking an exam this morning for school. And what's the, what's the exam? What's the, what's the exam for? Uh, it's for my uh, correctional uh, supervising interviewing class. And uh, I was struggling to get a high A, but I, I got a low A instead. <laughs> Great. So your mom watched the kids, which allowed you to take the test, which allows for what in your future? to be successful, to possibly, yep. you know. Great. So you see, it's it's not just thank you for watching the kids. It's because you did this, I got that. Okay, thank you, Millie. One other person. Um, I'm going to thank the warehouseman who called me or emailed me this morning telling me my order had not shipped and 
took the time to send me an email to say it wasn't there. I was able to put it back together and send it out. I've actually already sent the thank you email because I believe that when they give us that thing, we have to give back to make sure they understand their, their value. So are you going to email him or are you going to call him? I've done both. <laughs> we okay, talked good. about it. And then I, I followed up. Thank you for the, thank you for the heads up. I appreciate it. And I sent that off an email, but we talked about it in between too. And again, I told him, thank you for, for making me aware. It's important. So I want you to go one step further by him telling you that there was a mistake. What does it allow for pace? What does it allow for you when you know there's been a mistake like that? What's the big picture? What anchor, what strategic anchor does it exemplify? I was able to get the customer their boiler today. <laughs> Good. So what I want you to hear, I want you to hear is sometimes for us, our brain is so fast, we think they get it. We think they connect the dots. Conveying role value is about connecting the dots for people. I get that. All right, one more person. Can I go next? Yes. This is a, this is a live. <laughs> a live one for someone in the in the meeting. I want to thank Heidi for um, you know, I, I'm what on my fifth day on the job. And after meeting her on Zoom the other day, every time I give a call and ask her for help me out with what are the branches, what are the regions, help me out with. I'm drafting an email to the survey respondents. Would you mind looking at it? Because I don't have the most answers. What that has done for me, Heidi, is that I know that I'm coming in, you're helping me with my transition. And that's very valuable to me. And I thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> What's that I'm, for? I'm so happy to have you. I'll do <laughs> whatever I can to help. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> So I don't know if anybody can see, if everybody can see her face, but <laughs> the acknowledgement that Heidi, uh, as she was getting acknowledged, this was present <laughs> joy. It's not only joyful for the person giving the acknowledgement, it's joyful for the person receiving, right? Okay, last thing we're gonna talk about as far as servant leadership, and this is something I, this is another liberating structure that I'd like to introduce you to, and I'd like y'all to be thinking about how you can use it, and it's called appreciative interviews. So when this is done is somebody does something pretty special. It's, it, it's, it's they have accomplished something that, other people were complaining about, moaning about, but no, this person went in and actually fixed it. And because they fixed it, there was a positive end result. And an appreciative interview is somebody, maybe from HR or not, somebody finds that person and says, can you walk me through what the problem you were trying to solve was? And can you walk me through how you knew it was a problem. And can you walk me through the steps you took to solve the problems or the problem? And by the way, how did all that feel? What did you have to overcome? You know, maybe, maybe they were shy, maybe they were bossy and they needed to be less bossy. And then can you share with me the end result and who it impacted? And then could you share with me how it feels that you went through all that? When people get an opportunity to share their journey with you, like we saw in the first 20 minutes of the call with the, the lady sharing their PWP Shark Tank experience. Now we didn't go through the whole appreciative interview, but when we pick people on our team to do this with, it accomplishes several things. I'd like you to unmute yourself. And I have the whole process. If you guys say, oh, she didn't give us enough time to to tell us exactly how to do it. I have the process if you want it. Ask Vivian or knowing Vivian, you'll automatically get it because that's who Vivian is. She wants to over deliver and give you guys everything you need. 
So what are you hearing are, is the power of an appreciative interview. What can you do with it? And think through your strategic anchors, your mission, and your values. Anybody? Appreciation. Yeah, good. What else? Acknowledgement. Yep. What else? Thank you. Validation. Yes. What else? Recognition. Say that again, Giselle. Uh, I said, I, I started saying uh, your presence. You're really present with them. Yeah, good. Somebody else was saying something that I didn't hear. And I and maybe it was Natalie. Oh, Bettina. You're on mute. Recognition? No. Yes, good. Dominique? Understanding. Yep. So, so all that, yes. What does it do when you ask somebody about the thought process, about what they were dealing with and how they solved it? Think in terms of your thematic goal. Well, it empowers them to continue doing that, right? Well, one thing, I mm -hmm. and it shows that you're that they're being accountable to the core values, and uh, it acknowledges their accountability to working through. Good. And what's the thematic goal for this year? Um, isn't, it building, isn't it building infrastructure for a sustainable growth? Good. So Beth, what did you wanna say? You were on mute. I'm, I'm sorry, I was talking about my daughter squeezing an orange. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's good. So. How does an appreciative interview help you build infrastructure or build nimble processes? It How would, what'd you say? I think it's very validating and empowering to, to keep going. And you know, if you're showing someone that, that you appreciate the, the thought process that they went through and then um, owning, owning it and then moving forward, then they're going to be empowered. They're going to show that you care about them having the accountability. Um, Good. Good. Um, I wanted to add, I, I think it gives you the opportunity to find out where some of the breakdowns are in the process so that you get a better understanding of how to fix it. Right on. All of this, everything everyone said, and when you take time to learn how did you fix that? Why did you fix that? What did you do? You are now creating a process and you don't need a major initiative to do that. Just get curious. So appreciative interviews are only possible if you understand role, conveying role value. And that's only possible if you understand empathy. And that's only possible if you're present. And that's only possible if you create the space where people will give you the opportunity to be present because they're with you. So you can't, you can go around to everybody and tell them how empathetic you are, but if you're never present and you're not really hearing, you're not very empathetic, but you can lie to yourself. So all of this, if you look at your inner metrics and it talks about serving others, it's about accountability. It's about empathy. It's about conveying role value. It's about evaluating folks and helping them see what they need to do to become better. So we're gonna wrap up uh, soon, but we wanna just make sure you, you understand that evaluating others, telling the truth about where somebody is achieving and not achieving, that is a gift. Ignoring poor performance. Now the whole first 20 minutes, we talked about accountability. Ignoring poor performance doesn't help anybody be the best person they could be. It actually, you guys, your company for some of you is located up in wine country. It's like leaving a little grape on the vine to shrivel up. We need to neutrally, remember the Buddha, neutrally say, hey, Dominique, you said you were gonna schedule those meetings. They didn't get scheduled. There's an impact. We gotta talk about that. And then Dominique's gotta be willing to say, yes, sorry, I let you down. That's not gonna happen again. 
But if we never evaluate performance, if we ignore it, we can never help her get better. Does that make sense? We've got to tell people what we need from them. We've got to be clear what their job is. We've got to be clear how we evaluate performance. And it goes both ways. If Ezra wants to have a relationship with her boss and her boss doesn't understand how she communicates or how she learns, she's got to say, hey, John, if John, I'm making that up. I don't know if John's your boss or not. But if John's her boss, you say, John, I'm noticing we're having some communication breakdowns. Would really work for me. I could do a better job for you if you actually gave me 20 minutes at the onset of all new projects so we could gain clarity and I could be really clear about what the deliverable is. But you see, many of you go off and you try to do a deliverable and you're not clear what it is. So one of the women I coach, I was working with her and her boss because the boss was not very happy and they wanted my intervention. And at the end of the meeting, she says, I thought I was on the mark, which is why I never checked in. But then I realized I didn't even know where the mark was. We can't evaluate performance or hold people accountable if they don't know what's needed. All right, so we are going to complete. I would like to hear from every person. We have about three minutes, so it doesn't have to be a big story, but what are you walking away with today? Follow up. How, to be, how to be more present. Okay, good. Part of the Next. solution and not the problem by using more presence. Thank you, Margaret. I'm walking away with engagement because you can't be, you can't make a difference if you're invisible. So that, that hit home for me. Yeah, awesome, thank you. I'm walking getting, away with getting, setting getting clear deeper boundaries. with the nine words. Okay, so we had two people talking at once. Natalie go first and Catherine go second. So ladies, what I want you to start doing, uh, because we're gonna do this live, but we also do this in our Ignite Power Program, which has been re remote. When you look into the screen and you start talking, look for who else has got the yellow bar around them. So if there's a yellow bar around someone else, don't talk. So I'll shut up and then you go, Natalie. I'm walking away with setting clear boundaries and being comfortable with setting those boundaries. Thank you. Um, I, uh, going deeper with the nine whys to really get to the core. Thank you. Especially in learning and development, Catherine. I'm walking away with working on being more present in my team meeting. Thank you. I'm walking away with, um, being confident that I, I can be the change whether they took your idea or not. Thank you. I'm taking away that I'm gonna be less tolerating of the things that are holding me back. Thank you. I'm walking, I'm walking. with um, holding my boundaries and being vulnerable yet allowing that to be safe. Thank you. I'm walking away with reevaluating my mark, not just in my career, but life, because I may think that I'm on the mark and I never had that conversation with myself of where the mark is. Great. Thank you. I'm and being, I had walking away with paying more attention to my presence in delivery. Thank you. Like Melanie, presence and trying not to multitask with your good reminder again that it doesn't, it, it's not efficient. Yeah, so there is a book. Um, uh, Suzanne, could you find it? We won't be able to do it today, but about the, the book about that says why multitasking is so bad for your brain. It's actually really bad for your brain. Okay, who else? I'll go. Setting myself up, 
sooner in the day so that I can be more present later on and cutting out either habits I'm doing myself that are holding me back that I've been tolerating or cutting people out that I've been letting them slide with habits that I've been tolerating that aren't helping me move forward. Thank you. We're going we're gonna to go a couple minutes extra because I want everybody to, to have a chance. So Jenny, uh, Sarah, go. Uh, setting boundaries. Thank you. Um, I'm walking away with evaluating who my five uh, people are that I spend the most time with in a day. Thank you. I'm walking away with um, my presence requires absolute focus. And so just tuning that in and fine tuning that. Thank you. I'm walking away with the realization that um, I tend to be very task focused, but actually people are really important to me. And I need to remember that as I focus on tasks and, and people both. Nine wise, good, <laughs> thank you. I'm, I'll go, I'm walking away with boundaries, like working on with, not only with work, but in my personal life. Thank you. Nancy, did you go? Okay, good. Is that everybody? Lynette? Uh, I'll go next. Uh, I got a change will happen will, yeah, change will happen within. And I am visible and I am worthy to be heard. Thank you. Awesome. Everybody's like, yes, Lynette. I'm working away with like three pages of notes. So I'm having a hard time getting one, but I think it's going to be making a list of things that I'm tolerating that I'm over it. Yeah. Now, are you all still meeting with each other for your buddies? If you're not reconnect with your buddy, call them. If, if so, what, who cares if it didn't work last week, make it work. You've got all of October and half of November to bring home all of this training and everything you've learned will be, a, will be it, it's a cumulative process. So thank it. Did everybody get to go? I want to make sure I'm not dissing anybody here. Everybody get to go? Malou? Yeah. Yeah. I often say I choose my friends at work. So my mm -hmm. takeaway is that five. I'm new. I think I've chosen some already, <laughs> but yeah, I'll be more conscious of, you know, I practice that principle, but I never thought there was a title to it. <laughs> That's Great. my takeaway. Great, thank you. So ladies, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna be the trainer for next week too, is that right? For two weeks. Thank you, you guys. I never ask for testimonials myself. If you like this program, Vivian will put it in the chat box. Please leave us a Google review. We want to make a difference for women at other organizations that are male dominated. I'm sure there was one of the trainers that you've had. You can acknowledge them in the Google review. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being vulnerable. Namaste. Goodbye.